日本史学習に最高にもってこいのサイトサムライアーカイブスポッドキャストへようこそ美しい自然にあふれてる縄文時代から波乱万丈な幕末まで全時代を網羅して日本史の隅から隅まで一緒に語り合いましょうでは早速日本史の世界へレッツゴー Hey everyone, back to the Samurai Archives podcast. Today I'll be talking with the host of the Sengoku Daimyo's Chronicles of Japan podcast, Joshua Badgley. It's a new podcast that does, well, what the title says. Josh is chronicling the history of Japan from ancient prehistory forward. And we get into all that and more in this episode. And before we get started, be sure to check out patreon.com slash samurai archives to see how you can help out the podcast and all the bonus content that we have available. All right, let's get started. Oh, thanks, Chris. Really appreciate this.、Uh, my name is Joshua, and I am putting together something called、uh, Sengoku Daimyo's、uh, Chronicles of Japan podcast. It is something, honestly, I've had kind of in my head for a while now, and I kept expecting someone else to do it before me because I felt so busy. But it really is just a chronological history of Japan.、Um, I'm going back to the very beginning, started with a prehistoric. Japan, you know, really、uh, Paleolithic, and working my way through. I am taken a little bit aback. I did this because I love the Nara period and really wanted to get into the stuff of the Nara period. I feel people, a lot of people go into Genji and what goes on in Heian. You get the Genpei Wars and everyone's all over the tale of Heike and you get the Sengoku and all that. But I just never felt there was enough emphasis on Nara and what was happening then. And I thought it'd be really cool to go into that. And now I'm stuck in Jomon and Yayoi because there is just so much going on. And what I thought would be a quick overview and recap has kind of absorbed all my attention. It's.、Uh... Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's super interesting. I,、uh, we, we did a way, way, but I got, I think it was like 2011 or 2012, we did、uh, a couple episodes on the, the Jomon and Yayoi. And. I think we only, it was maybe two or three hours total, but there was just such a massive amount. I mean, you go into the,、uh, the, the immigration, the population already there, the moving over from the mainland, the DNA, there's, there's a zillion different things going on. Oh, yeah. And looking into the research, obviously, a lot of this stuff I hadn't really looked into before. I had no idea that a volcano had basically wiped out Southern Kyushu. And the whole idea that Southern Kyushu was uninhabitable for like 800 years just blows my mind. I mean, I've been down there and I just can't think of it like that. I,、uh, I think I've fin- I'm through two episodes, I believe. So I think it's episode three you talk about the volcano. Is that、uh, right or is that episode four? Episode four.、Um, okay, so I'm, I'm through episode three. So I'm,、uh, I'm about halfway through the podcast right now. But,、uh, I should warn you spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> I was,、uh, you know, I was down in、uh, Aso in Kumamoto, and Aso is a giant caldera, apparently.、Yeah. It's just a massive caldera. I mean, I don't even know how many miles wide it is, but it's, I mean, if that thing was to ever blow, that, that would be insane. Well, when、uh, the Kikai caldera went, apparently it is one of the three largest explosions, eruptions that have happened in the past 10,000 years.、Um, wow. Yeah. And, You know, studying most popular history, that's, you never hear about it. It's, it's so far back, no one really goes into it. They just kind of pass by. But what area is that?、Uh, where was the caldera located?、Um, so, oddly enough, I found this really kind of freaky myself.、Um, the podcast on that actually dropped on November 1st, and Iwo Jima, not Iwo Jima, Iwo Jima.、Um, Erupted or, or had a notice, notification about eruption like the next day.、Uh, that is part of that whole caldera system. It's still active. Obviously, I don't think anyone's expecting another e- eruption that size out of it, but it was just it was weird. It's that same place、um, mm. just south of、uh, Kagoshima.、Uh, wow. I kind of want to go there now, but. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know there was, a, what was it? there was a volcano that erupted back in, I think, the 80s, maybe early 90s,、uh, south of Shimabara. I'm forgetting the name of it, but we actually took a bus trip down there 
when I was living in Japan in uh, 95 or 96. And I forget the name of the mountain, but basically the base of the mountain, all of the houses, all you can, they're just the roofs are sticking out of the ground, basically. It's sort of, it's sort of a surreal place to visit. Wow. So it's still there and just everything's been covered in ash and... Yeah, yeah. Wow. It was, uh, and I think it was the late 80s, if that, if I remember correctly, but it was somewhere south of uh, Shimabara. And yeah, all the, the, the whole area is basically just under ash. So the rooftops are basically, you know, the, the, the Japanese, uh, the roofing tiles yeah. are basically just sticking out of the ground. In some ways, I'm surprised that volcanoes haven't like played a greater part in Japanese history overall. Um, I mean, we don't hear of like a Vesuvius really a Japanese Vesuvius type uh, situation, but it is a really active, you know, area. Heck, onsen. I mean, without that, you wouldn't have the onsen uh, phenomenon that you oh, do. Right. <laughs> you wouldn't. So. But there are a massive amount of earthquakes. There's, there's constant uh, earthquakes. That is true. I mean, one of my favorite stories is, of course, the Daibutsu in Kamakura, which I know you and pretty much everyone's been to, but that whole idea that you know um he he busted out of the temple to go fight a giant carp that was thrashing around in the bay actually being <laughs> you know of course a uh the the actual story being a tsunami you know earthquake and a tsunami and basically took out everything except this large statue of the buddha that was too heavy to, to move I mean, right, right. Talk about surreal experiences. Can you imagine being the, 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 the peasant samurai, whoever, who came down after that event and saw the statue of the Buddha sitting there? Everything else must have just been entirely wiped off the face of the map. But, mm. I mean, it's there. And this is the kind of thing I kind of like to think about is it's easy to read it. It's easy to see it later on. But to think of what it was like back then to see what people would have experienced, what would they have known? Right, um, right. At least to the best of our ability. Japan is an interesting place as far as, yeah, I mean, I never really actually thought about it too, but uh, yeah, you've got the, the, the earthquakes, the volcanoes, and there, there are a, a collection of, of earthquakes that had impacts in Japanese history. I can't, I th feel like there were some in the Sengoku period that are even, even mentioned, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of things going on. But, um, you know, actually, I was uh, one thing I was thinking was that uh, so the, the title of your podcast, some people might actually be wondering about the, the reference to Sengoku Daimyo and, uh, you know, the, the connection to Sengoku Daimyo dot com. So to kind of give people some background on on that, I think it might that might be something worth looking at. That's true. Um, so obviously it's might be weird to people that a sen that a podcast named Sengoku Daimyo is currently talking about the Jomon and the Yayoi period. Um, SengokuDaimyo.com is the website that we're currently running. Um, Sengoku Daimyo was actually started by uh, our friend, Tony, um, Anthony mm -hmm. J. Bryant. And it was kind of his website where he put everything up. Um, you know, the stuff that he was working on, particularly his, I'll say, uh, what are we calling it now? E experimental archaeology. Uh, basically mm. all of his reenactment stuff, his stuff for how to put together armor, his stuff for how camps worked. Um, what do you call people back in uh, old Japan? Um, all focused largely on the Sengoku period, though he has he had plenty of stuff on the Heian and earlier. I was really kind of a student of his, a friend, and unfortunately when he passed away, you know, so many years ago, he asked that we keep everything up um, prior to that, and in his will, he asked that we do that. So we've been trying to keep the site going, um, trying to add some updated content where we can. Uh, we've added a translation of Rori Monogatari, for instance, uh, in an old uh, Japanese recipe book. And so when kind of the idea for this podcast came, it seemed like a natural venue to attach it to that. Uh, we just recently did an upgrade of the site to... Uh, something more than 2004 uh, web page technology. Mm. <laughs> uh, and we're trying to keep it up for those who use it and trying to also add some new stuff, new content. Um, this podcast really is kind of something separate, but together. So it's a way that I think we can add our own bit to the history that he started. Hmm. 
And I guess I'll, I'll ask the, uh, the obvious question. Uh, you had mentioned you were kind of thinking about this type of podcast, but what, what actually made you decide to go ahead and do it? Because I know it's from, from personal firsthand experience, it's, it's pretty daunting to kind of, you know, when you're, you know, facing down the volume of research it's going to take to actually put something like this together. Um, one, I didn't really face the amount of research that I thought that, uh, I would need to do. That was something that I thought about and didn't even realize um at the same time it was an impetus i found myself it feels like in the past i had done a lot more reading i would buy books i'd read through them i'd i'd do study and these days i just wasn't doing as much as i'd like so i really saw it almost as a chance for to put some oomph behind my own research and it's certainly done that the other part of it though a really two two phase one i knew someone and i was talking to them and they were talking about retiring and how they'd gotten you know they they, they wish they hadn't waited so long uh before getting into things so i constantly mm. thought about well when i have time mm -hmm. i'll i'll wait and i'll do that when i have time and I finally said, you know what? I'm never really going to have time. I'm always going to find a way to fill it. So I may as well fill it with things that I want to do. And then the last bit of the puzzle is a really odd one. If anyone out there knows the Joko Cruz, um, Jonathan Colton, kind of a, uh, how, how best to put it, a uh, nerd musician. Uh, hmm. he, he, he has a cruise and he invites a lot of people, a lot of really cool entertainers and several podcast uh, folks and I started listening to enough podcasts to say you know what I think that that might be something to try so I don't know that 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 kind of all went into it there's a lot of other podcasts I've been listening to obviously Samurai Archives um, I think what you guys have been doing is great um, Isaac Myers History of Japan and a few others uh, out there History of uh, History of Britain uh, the British History Podcast and History mm. of China all these kind of got me thinking, you know, this is something that's actually doable. I don't think I'm doing quite as well as most of you all. I think you all have uh, are much more polished, but uh, I'm giving it a shot, trying to learn the ropes as I go. <laughs> well, I can definitely say that your uh, your production value is, is high enough because when we first started back in 2011, and actually, technically, I think the first episode we ever recorded was in 2010, and we had no idea what we were doing. So we just literally had an open mic in a room, and that went on for a couple of years. So, yeah, so you're, you're doing a lot better than we, are, we were when we started. <laughs> We've been playing around with some of the audio, and uh, we, we actually played with a group of folks around a table, and we found that it is almost unlistenable. It is, so, yeah. Um, that wasn't for this podcast. It was for something else. But we, it definitely, there have been some learning, uh, some learning curves in there. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, so I, I was curious too about. Uh, so it sounds like, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but your kind of your your strategy in putting together the episodes and your research is kind of like it's stuff that you'd be reading anyway. So you're just kind of taking notes as you go, or or do you are you more focused than that? Um. So. That was kind of the initial impression I had. And then what happened was I started asking myself questions. I, I've actually, I hope my Yayoi era is going to be better than the Jomon era. In the Jomon era, I entered with the thought that I actually knew what I was talking about, which is was my first mistake. <laughs> um, I went in and found a bunch of stuff that I already knew. Uh, I had Imamura Keiji's book on... Uh, prehistory I looked at it I had right that's a great book it is but as I started finding out more and more just finding out how dated it is there has been so much research that has happened in Jomon just in the past decade um, Jomon Yayoi uh, when did rice first come to Japan mm. heck I entered this still thinking Yayoi being oh 300 BCE to 300 CE I was completely out of the loop in terms of the fact that uh, they found they've carbon dated rice now all the way to about um, the first millennia BCE um, hmm. and all the problems that's causing for Yayoi discussion because 
Did rice actually come with bronze and iron? And if so, what does that mean for the Korean Peninsula? And that's led me down all sorts of little nooks and crannies trying to find the papers and research and then dating them to figure out when people actually said something because it is it is an extremely fluid area where people are really doing some groundbreaking research it's not just something that we know it is something that people are still investigating um, i'm just now getting into the research on uh, yamato yamatai and oh my head is spinning oh <laughs> Just, is Yamatai actually Yamato? Is it not? Is it in Kyushu? Is it in the Kinki region? Where is it? What was it? Is Pimiko Pimiko? Is that actually a, even a name? And half of that because some uh, Chinese sailor couldn't write down directions correctly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or they could. Well, yeah, probably not, given the way some of that comes across. But, yeah. So I assume you've been uh, diving into, like, Gina Barnes... Oh yeah. Um, Barnes has, Gina Barnes has an excellent, uh, book that you can actually get on Kindle. Um, and I am blanking on the name of it right now, but I, if if you look, she has uh, a book on Kindle on China, Korea, Japanese history, just basically the archeology span of East Asia. And I highly recommend it. She has been keeping it updated. Um, so you can go to Kindle, actually get the latest version of the book, which means all the latest revisions. Um, seems pretty up to date with the other research I've been reading, which is awesome. Her, uh, someone that I've really been reading a lot is Alexander uh, Vovan, or Vovin. I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce that, so my apologies to him. But uh, Oh, yeah, I, I met him at uh, UH way back. Okay, yeah. He's a he's a very interesting Russian guy. His work on Japonic and just where it comes from, and at least to me, is very compelling. His idea, the whole idea of uh, Peninsular Japonic, that there was a Japonic language spoken on the Korean Peninsula prior to Korean coming down, and that it actually isn't related to Korean like everyone says. That That's kind of making me rethink some of the things about where all these theories are coming from. So uh, that's those have been some of the names I can come up with off the top of my head. The rest of it, uh, I probably don't have the most um, rigorous uh, documenting methodology <laughs> at all. <laughs> I, I've been generally using an open word uh, document where I, as I read through these, I take notes on everything of what's going on and the things that I think would be of interest to people in the podcast. Um, the things that are of interest to me, the things that are helping to build what I see as the story of Japan. And I try to at least give people the references um, in the on the podcast page afterwards. So as I release each episode, I'm trying to make sure that people have the references I used. Um, my goal is that hopefully if people notice, hey, there's something you missed, there's research you missed, they can make note of it and let me know uh i on twitter that already happened uh someone pointed me to some of the research that's going on in the sakhalin and kuril islands um i think it's in the mm. in kuril actually on the jomon up there and going back and listening of course i realized i said that the jomon hadn't made it up to kuril the jomon hadn't made it up to kuril by the end of the jomon period in honshu but technically the Jomon period, which continued in Hokkaido, even as the Yayoi period was going strong down south, was actually expanding into the islands. So I took stuff like that, and I'm trying to make sure that I go back and fix any actual factual errors. I think I'd already love to go back and fix some of the other errors, but as long as they're not factual, I'm leaving them alone for right now. Yeah, that's a, that's always a, you know, when you, you, you put out a podcast and you realize like, oh, there's all this other information that I didn't even realize, which actually came across with uh, like the Mori Motonari podcast, for example. But, you know, as far as the Kuril Islands, I w- it's interesting because I, I, was, uh, I wasn't sure if the Siberians had come down from the Kamchatka Peninsula and went that way or if they came up from Japan. So is it, is it, does it look like they came up from Japan then? So based on... Based on the limited reading I did, and I honestly haven't been focusing too much on Hokkaido and too far north because 
let's face it, for most of Japanese history, they aren't really part of what you would call Japan. Right, um, right. So I do want to get into the whole thing with Ainu. Um, that is kind of fascinating to me. But it does look they're finding... Let's put it this way. They're finding Jomon material culture up there. My understanding is the current thought is Jomon, kind of in the south of the Jomon, Hokkaido, Tohoku area, you get the influence from the Yayoi. Up north, they meet with, I want to say it's the ancestors of the Nivka uh, people. Oh, yeah. There's the Nivka. There's the Gilyak. There's, yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of different tribes up there. So it's like, I think you're right. There's some groups coming down from the north and Hokkaido pushing up from the south. And then that mix probably, maybe, kind of forms what becomes the Okotsk Sea culture. And then from there, I think the next phase is basically the early Ainu and then what we see as the Ainu today. But I really have to go into it. I I haven't uh, done enough study past just that they're finding Jomon in the Kuril Islands. Yeah, I find that area so fascinating, especially that that uh, that time frame, because there's there's so many so much different things going on and so much mixing. Yeah, and uh, it's something I really want to focus on at some point. I, I I mean, it's been a long term plan for like two years to actually do an episode about the uh, the the tribes of Ezo and uh, of Siberia and and kind of look at that. someday, someday I'll get to it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's. I think what captured my attention on that was all the stuff that's been happening in the last few years, really, in terms of uh, the Japanese actually recognizing the Ainu as an indigenous culture and some of the um, recent legislation. So I think that brought it to the forefront and made me think Mm. about it a little bit more, um, along with just how any group is portrayed. Um, There's been so many things said about the Ainu by people who are not Ainu. That whole region is uh, is an interesting area and one that I suspect there's a lot of opportunity to get to know it much better than it's known today. So I'm curious. So since we're uh, you know looking at the, the the time frame here as far as the podcast and everything else, um, so you're you're about you're six episodes in and you're you're still in the Yoyoi period. So <laughs> I'm just curious. So uh, where did you think you'd be six episodes in before you started and and how how long do you think it's going to take you to get to say the the end of the Edo period at this at this rate? Oh, I'm expecting that this is a multi year journey. Heck, I don't know if I'll ever get to the end of the Edo period. We'll see. I, I hope I make it that far. <laughs> um, as long as there are interesting stories, I don't so much mind. I mean, again, I think one of the great things about like the Samurai Archives podcast and the History of Japan podcast is you guys cover a lot of the major big events that happened all throughout the thing that I'm kind of hoping to do with this is find those areas that people might not otherwise dive into. Um, I know for one, I never would have dived into the Yayoi period. Like I have, if it weren't for all this getting into, I'm looking forward really to getting into the the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki. I think that's going to take me probably (laughs) that could take me a year to get through. If I spend time, you know, just going through every, rain um you know kind of looking at it whether it's true or not um going through the stories that are in those histories salacious bits and all (laughs) (laughs) i have to say in the kojiki some of the best pickup lines are there and uh you know the excuse me tell me about your form i find my form is empty in one place i find my form sticks out in one place we should part. We should put the part that sticks out in the place that that is empty. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, this has been your hey, cultural. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, there's some stuff in there that is. I, I don't think we spend enough time just getting to know. Uh, mm. So I guess, so you're looking to do like a, a general history of Japan from start to finish? Because normally, the reason I ask is because normally when people are doing like a history podcast, a lot of the times they do that sort of the, the I don't know what you call it, the, 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 the big man 
uh, on stage view of history where it's like, oh, in this period, Oda Nobunaga did this, 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 and that, and he drove history. And then in this period, this guy did this, 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 and that, and he drove history at that point. So are you just are you looking more towards a, a narrative of the actual history itself rather than focusing on sort of the big the big men in in history? Um, obviously. So I don't think you can avoid the big men, though. I think there's been enough talk about the great men theory, especially given that it often does focus on the great men. Um, I do want to dive into those areas that are a little less known, um, a little more on understanding the cultural history. I think that one of our problems with history is we tend to view it through our modern lens. Oh, definitely. We, we look at it and we say, and, and we ascribe motivations to people. We take a look at folks and we say, how would we have acted? And then the other piece is we treat it like it is a movie. And in a movie, mm. you've got that, the hero who goes off and he does his thing and hooray, that happened. History is so much more complex. It There's so much more that's happening. I really want to get into like the lives of the regular people. What was going on? What was everything that was happening? You know, understanding... I think it's in the Taiheiki where they talk about the person loyal to the emperor, a member of the court, who makes a faux pas in how he reads some document so that he can be embarrassed, so that he can have an excuse to go leave the court, so he can go travel around Japan and figure out what's happening. Without fully understanding just how much that embarrassment would have cost him at court, it's hard sometimes for people to envision, like, why is this a thing? Why, why was it so important that he misread a character once and suddenly that gets him blackballed from court? What's going on here? You know, to understand that, you have to understand the motivations and the cultural values of the people of the time, not just a, well, he was embarrassed. We all understand how embarrassment goes, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I want to get more into that. Um, huh. So what is, so what's your long term uh, plan with the podcast? Is it to uh, chronologically go through the end of the Edo period or or what or have you really thought that far ahead because it sounds like think that that's that could be potentially years down the road oh i think it's i i absolutely think it's years down the road um in, in this particular instance i look at jamie and the british history podcast who has been on air for i don't know how many years and they are still before 1066 in british history um mm. and that's been something i know i've enjoyed for quite some time so Hopefully this is something similar that people will enjoy as well. So, no, don't expect that I'm going to get to the Sengoku Daimyo, the Sengoku period, anytime soon. Um, <laughs> I, I do hope that we'll get through the Kofun period and into the Nihon Shoki and the Kojiki uh, probably in the next uh, several months. But the Edo period is so far out, and, and I'll tell you a secret. I've never really been interested in the Edo period I'm hoping this gets me interested in the Edo period more, but uh... <laughs> well, you're in you're in you're you're in good company. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I say that tongue in cheek. I have started to get more interested in some of the stuff there, but honestly, there's so much in the Nara that I just don't think has been explored. I expect I can spend an entire year just in the Nara period alone. Yeah, hating on the uh, hating on the Edo period has kind of been a running joke with the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, are are you are, would your would your one of your goals then be to kind of try and take your time with it and fill in as many spots as possible as you go? Like, do a, a long term description of Japanese history, trying to fill in those uh, all those those uh, you know as much detail as possible, rather than do sort of a, a brief overview of each period as you go. It's it's part of, I wouldn't say it's part of my motivation, but it's definitely something I can see happening. I'm already trying to figure out what goes in and what doesn't. Um, mm. There's a whole section in the Jomon period about these clay masks. And honestly, I couldn't find enough information about them to really go into depth. I didn't feel I could do it justice. So some of that stuff got left off the side. 
probably similarly, I'll tell the stories that I can. It probably will be more of what's happening around Japan within particular eras at particular times, what was leading up to various events. Um, I may not, you know, tell this, I may or may not tell the story of say what happened in this one fife at this one time at this one particular moment, if it didn't have some impact or illumination across the larger, broader breadth of Japan. Mm. But I say that now, <laughs> <laughs> if I come upon the story and it seems really interesting and I think other people would be interested in it, I may just go there. It, it... <laughs> so I, I have to ask, and you, there, there may not be an answer, but uh, let's say theoretically down the road, you, you, you reach the end of the Edo period in your podcast. What are your plans after that? <laughs> have you even put any thought into it? Um, I think I'm going to take a long break. <laughs> <laughs> Fair um, enough. <laughs> If I got that far, I might continue on into the modern period, but it just, we'd have to see where it goes. Uh, other things that I'd like to do. So the other things that really um, involve, or, or the other things that really get me excited, and I'm hoping to discover more of this along the way, are, uh, it's so cliche, but martial arts history um, hmm. particularly Koryu. Uh, I practice Shindo Muso Ryujo outside of everything else. And the more I dig into it, the more I learn about it. Uh, those kinds of things just fascinate me. How did that come about? There's so much of what it is today. And how was that in the past? These are things that I'd probably be spending more time on. And uh, I was I was going to ask up front, and I, I forgot, so I'm going to ask now because it seems like the proper point. <laughs> I was going to ask you what brought you to Japanese history, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering if martial arts had a lot to do with it, because you always hear it's either martial arts, anime, or reading shogun. Those seem to be the <laughs> the three big uh, <laughs> the three three big things that bring people into Japanese history. But what was it in your case? Um, mine is a weird uh, introduction to Japan. Um, I moved around a lot as a child, and. My family was moving back to, of all places, Juneau, Alaska. Love it. Shout out to Juneau. Um, if people notice, I reference Plinkett and Northwest culture every once in a while. That's because I grew up up there. But uh, up there, I was being enrolled in high school. I had studied a little bit of German in middle school. They had no German class in uh, Juneau, Alaska. And so my... My stepdad was looking and going, where shall I put him? And they had a Russian or a Japanese language class. He enrolled me in the Japanese language class, and I've been really kind of hooked on the language and culture ever since. That actually led to me looking into an Aikido class that led me to martial arts more so than the other way around. Now, I went to school up in the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I was studying at the time uh, computer science. And really, that's kind of what led me. I had this grand vision that I would be one of these computer programmers that would go to Japan and somehow computers plus Japan would equal profit um, mm. <laughs> in that underpants gnome style. But uh, <laughs> uh, it really did. It led me to Japanese language plus martial arts kind of led me to a combination of anime and Japanese history, Japanese history. It sounds really corny, but there was a group on campus that was beating the heck out of each other in armor with big wooden sticks. They were called the SCA. It led me to, hey, I can actually experience history, which led me uh, eventually to meeting Tony. And Tony hmm. then was probably the biggest influence, um, hmm. just in terms of his encouragement. Uh, through him and through his site, I built a really crappy set of armor that um, <laughs> he said at least had the right idea. Um, I, I am not a maker. I do not claim to be a physical maker of things. Uh, but that led me into it. And then ever since then, Tony, the SCA experimental archaeology really made history feel alive for me in a way that books had not. 
Um, mm. I, I, I like studying. I like taking the, the classes, but I never thought of like going to school to study history. And I think that's because growing up, too much of history was dates and names. And do you remember this person at this date and this person this date? And that's how it felt anyway. And it was overwhelming. But when I started to see history as real people, when I started to see history as physical, a physical manifestation and understand it that way, it really kind of took me in another direction. And now I wanted to know where this stuff came from. How, how did it get there? What happened to it? How did, you know, why was armor the way it was? Well, you start looking back and you see where the Heian armor is, but then what is it like in the Heian period? What's it like in the Nara period? Well, wait a minute. We know how it is in the Kofun, but we've got this big gap. So what's going on there? And that leads you down a bunch of rabbit holes. Mm. And pretty soon you're like going, I need to actually find some Japanese book on this to figure out what the heck is going on. So that's kind of what led me down. It's, it's a circuitous path, I know, but that's how I got here. So actually, yeah, you're, what, what you had mentioned about uh, uh, history, like high school history, that really hit home for me because I remember uh, in my world history class, our teacher was basically like, okay, I want you to take these note cards and on the front of the note card, I want you to put the historical person's name and on the back, I want you to put their, their date, date of birth, date of death and their major contribution. And ours were like, Nebuchadnezzar, major contribution, he died. <laughs> <laughs> Was he the one with the gardens? <laughs> I can't remember. Um. I don't remember. I just remember Nebuchadnezzar and his major contribution was he died. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so there was a, there was a lot of that. History really didn't have much, didn't hold much interest for me until college. I didn't I didn't actually? Uh, I majored in political science, but I, I started getting into history in college. And uh, you know, same same typical cor- sort of path. I, I had read Shogun. I was in the martial arts, and that kind of led me. And then it, it actually was actually living in Japan is what really really got me because mm-hmm. you know I started visiting these oh, temples yeah. and and shrines and and castles. And the majority of my time in Japan was spent uh, drinking and learn focusing on learning Japanese. But I, I did spend a little bit of time traveling around, so that was interesting. But uh, uh, just out of curiosity, what what is your uh, what would be your favorite part of Japanese history? Your favorite era is, is it the Nara period, or is that just more of an interest in like, well, there's a lot of stuff to look I, at there. Whew. You know, I go back and forth. I, I I'm I'm a deli, uh what what is it a uh, dilettante with all of it dilettante. Yes, <laughs> I, I I tend to go back and forth. I find something ooh shiny. <laughs> I I really love the story. Um, and I think Herman Ooms really brought it out in his work on the whole Tenmu dynasty. I find that area fascinating, the, the start of the Fujiwara, how they came about, as well as that whole thing between Tenji and Tenmu and, and what happened there. I try to make it to the, either make it to the Nara History Muse- National History Museum in Nara every year for their show sewing exhibition, or at least get the catalog i'm very happy to my friend who sent it to me this year just the connection to the rest of asia that whole period along with the tang dynasty is fascinating it's vibrant it's cosmopolitan things you don't realize about japan like that you have a persian buddhist monk coming over in the early days you've got influences from the the iranian sogdian culture uh, via China coming down the Korean Peninsula into Japan, it it really is fascinating, and yet I feel it's never talked about. Like, I mean, in scholarly circles, yes, but from a popular history point of view, it feels like, hey, there's this thing called the Manyoshu, and let us show you Genji. The other part that really is fascinating in that, I think, part of my favorite, I, I love the Heian period. I love the clothes. It's awesome. I'm really curious where the transition from Nara to Heian culture materially is. So, um, On Myoji, one of my favorite uh, movies, I think that... Uh, Which one, though? There's been a zillion of them, hasn't there? <laughs> uh, well, On Myoji 1, just uh, Nomura Mansai as Abe no Seime. I think he just really I, I just love his same and 
everything about it just is picturesque. It's wonderful. And yet, historically, it is so wrong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's beautiful and, and wonderful. Uh, late, like, Heian Kamakura era court clothing for someone that should be living much earlier. Mm. And, and, and that sort of thing, like, really is what I want to understand better. Like, really what happened, the insei, the, the politics, and, and probably, I know, not everyone, oh, politics, what? But, heck, everyone seems to like Game of Thrones, and what is that but politics plus war? Right, uh, right. Well, politics plus war plus sex, but, well, that also applies to most of Japanese history. <laughs> <laughs> um I think next what fascinates me is the the startup of the Kamakura era. And, and what fascinates me more what I really love is not so much what's known but what people think they know. Um the common story of the Kamakura era is that you have this shogun who is this great generalissimo and therefore all the warriors just follow him. Or at least that seems to be the thing. Okay, now there's the Shogun, and the Shogun is now in charge of Japan. But when you really read about it, it's not so clear-cut. I mean, yes, the Shogun owned, you know, had certain rights and responsibilities and had a certain jurisdiction. But then you've got the whole system of the Buddhist temples. And then you've got the imperial system. And you've really got three governments all trying to govern at the same time. And that situation persists really for quite a while. Um, Tony used to have a, he, he shared with me his personal theory that Shogun was never really the title of importance until the Tokugawa made it something of importance. Hmm. His personal theory was that Tokugawa Ieyasu only took the title of Shogun because Kampaku had already been taken by Toyotomi. And, and prior to that, and, and therefore, Tokugawa Shoguns emphasized the glory of the Shogunate, but honestly, most of the Shoguns had ruled through other titles, and Shogun was just an ancillary part of who it was that they were. So, a lot of prior shoguns really wanted the court rank more so than the title shogun but the title shogun and power with over you know military affairs definitely wasn't anything to sneeze at yeah and the idea of not wanting to give legitimacy to hideyoshi's rule by taking a, a different title that's like a very japanese thing a very uh, it's very interesting and it was very difficult politically for him when you think about it because remember Hideyoshi had an heir, so mm. he he would have had to have taken the title and basically disinherited the heir. Oh, beforehand. That's a, that's a good point, yeah. And, and, you know, when you look at when those things happened, he could take the title of Shogun and, you know, do what the Kampaku had done, which is basically put the emperor in a box. And Well, let's face it, the retired emperors had put the living emperor in a box, and then the... Shogun, the Kampaku, had put even the retired emperors in a box. Now, as Shogun, he could put them in a box, say, go do all the important things to make state run, and meanwhile, we'll just handle things for you. Mm. Uh, so, sit here in this room, don't talk to anyone, and we'll tell everyone what you what needs to happen on your behalf. Yeah, <laughs> You can thank us later. Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned, uh, you know, the politics and the sort of the, the Game of Thrones idea. That's a, that's a, I think I feel like that's the thing about the Sengoku period, which is so interesting, but also like so overlooked. Every, everyone kind of looks at like, oh, it's these guys with swords that are and, and uh, you know, paper, paper uh, flags on the back killing each other on the battlefield. But the politics of the Sengoku period is just so ridiculously complex. Oh, my God. And I, yeah. I find that I find that really interesting because when I'm doing these uh uh, biographical episodes. You know, I, I just recently finished the Mori Motonari episode, and I'm working on Date Masamune. And my God, the 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 complex politics between these little clans in in like you know in Masamune's case, northern Japan, 
is insane. And, you know, and like, oh, the, we wiped out this clan, but my wife was from that clan and she really wants me to uh, kind of bring that clan back. So I'll appoint an heir from a different clan into that clan and call him this guy. And, and, it, and then uh, this guy's father betrayed me, but I'll take him on as a vassal. And, and you know, the, 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 the complexity of the politics is insane. And it's something that's really overlooked because it's, I don't know, I don't know why it's really overlooked, but you don't really find much in English about the the ridiculous complexity between clans. And I think I feel like that's the one thing about the Sengoku period that is kind of always going to have my attention. But like you, <laughs> there's a lot of things about other aspects of Japanese history that, that I find super fascinating and want to dive into. Uh, like, for example, the, uh, the uh, Okhotsk culture of, of northern Japan, the sea culture and the Jomon during the Jomon period and all of these Siberian tribes and also like the Meiji period, the, the sort of the modernization of Japan and these these former samurai who, uh, you know, become businessmen. I mean, there's a there's a lot of super fascinating things just, just dotted all, all throughout Japanese history. One thing I've never been interested in, and I don't feel like I can ever, maybe there's something in there that I just don't know about or haven't found. But, you know, the, the Heian period, Genji, that that stuff just just doesn't do it for me. <laughs> I think I've, I've tried to read Genji like three or four times in English, and I just can't do it. From our modern know. perspective, I mean, Genji is an absolutely reprehensible fellow. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's, and it's really... Hashtag me too. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what's so weird about it. I mean, this is being written by a female author who is actively taking on the male gaze and all this in order to... It, it, it just... Or, or at least it seems that way to a modern person. I don't know. Yeah. I actually like Say Shonagon better um, in some ways. She is much more catty and uh, direct. But that's another area where I think we get so focused on like the literary pursuits, we don't really get into the history of the politics. I mean, we don't go into old Kagami and the histories of that time and look at who was backstabbing whom and what was going on. I mean, heck, I really love Carl Friday's book, uh, First Samurai, taking a look out in the hinterlands and looking at folks like Taira uh, Masakado and his whole rebellion that was probably less of a rebellion and more of a, holy shit, I don't know what else to do because I've been outmaneuvered politically by my opponents, so I guess I'm a rebel now. Um, uh, there, there's so much there's pirates that are on the coast there's rebellions that are being put down left and right but this isn't the stuff we usually talk about we talk about what was going on in you know in Heian because frankly that's what all the nobles were talking about but this is the period when the samurai were becoming samurai I mean Kamakura didn't just happen and people all of a sudden go oh Oh, there's warriors. Where did they come from? I mean, they'd been around. They'd been coming into their own. They'd been taking on administration of these fiefdoms out in the fe- out out in the hinterland. But you don't read about it because it wasn't happening in the capital. So, I think there's more for you there. I think you just need to go outside of where most of the scholarship is focused. Oh, which of course is always a, a problem. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, so another thing I was I was thinking about is uh, the, the Japanese history is so vast, but there's also these little little mysteries like, uh, you know, was there a big conspiracy when Akechi Mitsuhide attacked Nobunaga or where is Yamatai and all these these little little mysteries just because some some guy failed to write it down. Um, are there any are, are there any any mysteries of Japanese history that you want to tackle you're fascinated by or even. If you had like a magical machine that could give you the the answer, is there is there anything that you would uh, look at specifically? Oh, absolutely. I mean, obviously, where the heck was Yamatai? And yeah, I yeah. feel like we're gaining more and more consensus, but it's also interesting. So the archaeologists don't want to be influenced by the histories, and the historians, it seems like, don't want to be too influenced by the archaeology. Right. I've always noticed that. It's always been very strange to me that they're they're kind of siloed in two separate Yeah. And they get into linguistics and then they're it's another thing entirely. Yeah. I do think there are more people putting taking a multidisciplinary approach. I really feel this is a backlash against 
some of the things that happened early on in history where people would read a history, see something, find an archaeological evidence in the ground and like make all these kind of mental contortions to make whatever they found obviously the thing in history. But uh, I, I, I do think there are still a lot of mysteries on how this all goes down. Where... One of the things I'm hoping to explore with the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki and why I'm starting with kind of the archaeological, linguistic, and other evidence leading up to like the 7th and 8th centuries is I then want to go back into the Kojiki, go back to the Nihon Shoki with that understanding of what do we know factually to go along with what are people telling us. And so we can kind of compare the two. I don't know that I'll be coming up with any answers on it, but just being able to explore the mystery, explore the discrepancies, um, hopefully in a way that further illuminates where it goes down the road. Um, one of the things that I've picked up listening to various podcasts, reading history, is this whole concept of truth versus fact. And, and, and it really struck me, when you read most things that are written down historically, it is there not to illuminate fact. Most people don't care about the facts after, well, after the fact. They care about the truth. Like, why are most histories written? Most of the histories are sponsored by some dynasty, some government, some political entity. And they all have purpose behind them. Um, I even have to think about that in my own podcast. What's my purpose? What are my innate biases that are going to influence what I say? And therefore, most histories are actually focusing, most ancient histories are focusing on what was the truth they wanted you to know about. If you read in Chinese history and you read about, you know, Confucian thoughts on the histories... They really care about the things that emphasize what makes Confucianism great. Um, hmm. When you read the Nihon Shoki and the Kojiki, let's face it, they're trying to talk about how Japan is this wonderful country, you know, empire that's been around since 660 BCE because that's a wonderfully convenient number. And they want to take the current ruling dynasty and say, hey, look, they are totes legit. And you should entirely be behind them because they're awesome. They're, they're not really going to say, hey, yeah, by the way. And actually, I think it's funny that what they do say and what they don't say is important. You know, about the whole thing with Tenji and Tenmu and how Tenmu basically overthrew the crown prince and becomes emperor. Um, <laughs> uh, it... it, it, it you know, they have a bit of a spin on that. But then when you suddenly see all the names in court change from one period to another and you scratch your head going, huh, I wonder what happened to all those others. It gives you a little insight into maybe what was really going on other than just what the histories want you to know. Yeah, the the one thing that the one that comes to mind for me is uh, Takeda Shingen being shot by a sniper. It seems that that story was put together in, in a history during the Edo period to kind of give credit to the Tokugawa side for killing Shingen, whereas I guess the reality is basically he just died of most likely stomach cancer is what it sounds like. But yeah, the, so that, that sort of the idea that he was killed by a sniper has, has hung around even to, uh, wasn't it uh, Akira Kurosawa who oh, yeah. he used that? Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's even around till today. Yeah, there you go. Love it. Kagemusha, that's you it. You know, great movie. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that, that sort of that history written to sort of glorify the Tokugawa side still still lasts even today. But, uh, you know, one other thing I was going to ask you is, uh, as far as the, uh, you know, ancient Japan, have you also looked at the the local fudoki of, uh, you know, well, at least the, the remaining ones? So that was part of the plan. I hadn't quite gotten there yet. Um, definitely part of, I wanted to look at what I could. I will admit, I am not a scholar of ancient Japanese, so I am not going to go into any of these... Um, and look at the original text and be able to absolutely translate. Although there is some remarkable work being done on computer translation of ancient Japanese 
uh, text, but I'm going to have to work at least with the modern Japanese versions, if not English versions. Um, so that's something I'm going to be looking at. I do know there are several out there. I'm interested even in where they're coming from, because my understanding is some of the Fudoki are not so much extant as they're rewritten, and I need to look into that more. Um, yeah, and I should also mention that for, for listeners who aren't aware, the Fudoki are, are like regional histories. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah. In, yeah, at the University of Hawaii Library, they actually have a bunch of them. And they're, I think they were, I mean, they're, they're big, massive tomes, and they're also really old. So if I remember correctly, it's been years since I've looked at them, but I think they were written like pre-20th century or early 20th century. So there, it's like that old Japanese, the sort of like pre-Joyo uh, Kanji Japanese, where there's a lot of katakana thrown in, and it's very confusing. But uh, they're, they're, it's... It, I'd love to see some English translations of these. Uh, that would be fascinating, but that's for someone that's for someone else to <laughs> to deal with. I know. Um, thank God for people like Ross Bender putting together like the Shokuni Hongi and stuff like that into right. English so that people can read it. It's I, I you know, God bless him. I, I <laughs> that that is not something I think I could spend my time doing, and yet here I am. So I don't know. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I can't do that. I can spend years going through every detail of Japanese history, but translating and, and writing this, I don't know. Well, thank you for having me on. Really appreciate it. Uh, obviously, uh, probably the one thing I should have mentioned earlier was uh, the impact also that Samurai Archives has had <laughs> and the community there. So, um, hey, everyone listening, you should go check out Samurai Archives if you haven't already. There's more to it than just a podcast. Um, yeah, there's a lot of lot of lot of stuff scattered about. <laughs> oh, so I, I still go back to the Samurai Archives wiki when I'm looking for things, and I find it in Wikipedia. But I'm like, eh, I'm not so sure about that, just because I know that the people who post to the wiki are in Samurai Archives are a little more vetted than uh, your Wikipedia authors. So mm. theoretically, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Somehow I got on there, so I don't know that I trust everything, but. Uh, so I guess uh, probably it would be good to uh, have you throw out the, uh, your podcast information, where to find it, your social media contact info. Let everyone figure out, you know, find out how to get a hold of you. Yeah. So um, on Twitter, it's uh, at Sengoku Podcast. On Facebook, you can look us up, just uh, Sengoku Daimyo. Uh, and of course, our website is www.sengokudaimyo.com slash podcast uh, for the podcast site. If you go to the .com, you'll get the rest of the site. Um so the Twitter is at Sengoku Podcast, and uh, the podcast itself, Chronicles of Japan, Sengoku Daimyo's Chronicles of Japan, um, should show up on all your major Spotify, uh, Apple Podcast, etc., wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay, that's it for another episode. Be back in approximately a month with another episode. And while you wait, please check out patreon.com slash Samurai Archives for bonus content and all the ways you can support the podcast. Also, shout out to Patreon member Dennis McDaniel. Thanks for your support. And thanks to all our supporters on Patreon. All right, and that's it for now, so see you next time. <laughs>